Okay, second video on the velodrome. This time we're going to assume the velodrome has some friction uh, between the wood and the tyre of the bicycle. So to recap, here's a bird's eye view of the velodrome. The upper outside lip there, the inner inside lip there, and then there's the path which the cyclist travels on. In our last video we said, briefly, if the cyclist is here and he's traveling too quickly, he'll fly up onto the upper edge like that. If he's going too slowly, he'll slip down towards the middle because of course this is a slant here pointing in that direction. And if you have a ball here to roll in that direction, if you have a ball here with starting velocity like that, its path will be there. Or if the velocity is very quick, it'll fly off the edge. That's all assuming the velodrome is frictionless, but if you've ever ridden a bike, you know that you can pretty much trace whatever circle you want uh, as long as there's friction between your tires and the banked road. So that's what we're going to be looking at here. There's a cross section of the velodrome. It looks, just as in the last video, like a triangle. And before we gave it an angle of 30 degrees, we're going to give it that same angle this time. So the angle that it's banked at is 30 degrees. Just in there. And then we'll have the cyclist modelled as a box, like so. What are the forces acting on this cyclist? If he has combined mass, rider and bicycle, 60 kilograms, he's got the weight force, 600 newtons. He's then got the normal force acting at right angles to the surface and this time he's also got a frictional force acting we'll assume in that direction there. We'll call it R for resistance. What I'm going to do is tell you that a cyclist is traveling in a circle of radius 60 meters. He weighs 60 kilograms and the frictional horizontal force between his tires and the wood is equal to 200 newtons. From this information we can work out exactly how fast or at what speed this cyclist is traveling. Let's proceed with that goal in mind. So there's only one goal for this question and that is what is the cyclist's speed? And I realized I've forgotten to put in v squared on r is equal to m sorry fc is equal to mv squared on r uh, the force of gravity is equal to mg and actually secondarily we'll find the period. I think this is pretty much all we need to know. First of all, recognize the cyclist is not slipping down nor sliding up that uh, slant there. He's also not moving in that direction there. He is however tracing a circle around horizontally. So just recognize the forces acting on the cyclist, the net force, is going to be purely horizontal, pointing towards the center of that green circle there. And it's not like that. It's pointing towards the center of the circle he's moving in. So I draw a dotted line. That is the net force on the cyclist. Now, if the net force is horizontal, that means all the forces acting in a vertical direction are going to have to cancel out somehow. So let's split up the normal force into a vertical component here and a horizontal component. And we'll do the same thing for that frictional force there. I'm actually going to change that net force line to a red. It's not a component, it's just the net force. So the force we get when we add all the other forces together. Okay, the vertical forces have to cancel out. Let's circle all the vertical forces. We have gravity here, we have the vertical component of the normal force, and the vertical component of the resistive force. These all have to cancel down to zero. So this plus this, take away this, is equal to zero. What is this length here? 
this angle in here is the same as this angle in here, 30 degrees. And this angle in here is also 30 degrees. Because as you can see, uh, that yellow line follows the same slant as the blue line. And it's in both cases, the angle between that slant and a horizontal line there and there. So the length of that opposite side there is going to be sine 30 r or sine 30 times 200 or 100 newtons. So the vertical component of the frictional force is 100 newtons that way. The vertical component of the normal force is going to be cos 30 degrees n. We don't yet know the normal force. So we're just going to leave it like that. We can say that's equal to root 3 n on 2. So all those forces have to cancel down. Let's write out that key line. Root 3 n on 2, this force, plus this force, so plus 100, is equal to 600. So we can either say take 600 equals 0, but I think it's better to say the upward forces equal the downward forces. So now we have root 3 n on 2 is equal to 500, take 100 from both sides, and we have n is equal to 2 times 500 on root 3, which comes to 577.4 so 577.4 and that gives us our normal force and you, you're wondering oh why why do we need the normal force why do we need the normal force it's because this component of the normal force here and this component of the friction force should add together to give us that net centripetal force there so let's figure out the length of that line there. That's equal to sine 30 degrees n. Now before, we didn't know what that was because n was a mystery. Now n is not a mystery. Sine 30 degrees n is 1 half, that's sine 30 degrees, times 577.4, which comes to 2... 88.7.7 newtons. That is this component of the normal force. In previous questions, this component of the normal force supplied all of the centripetal force because there were no other forces acting in the horizontal direction. Not this time, because this time, this part of the frictional force is also acting in the horizontal direction. So what's the size of that force? That's cos 30 degrees times r, which is root 3 on 2 times 200, which is, what, 86 times 2, one, around 172, root 3 on 2 times 200, 173.2 newtons. So we've got 288.7 newtons acting in that direction and 173.2 newtons acting in that direction. So the net force horizontally is equal to 288.7 take away 173.2 which is equal to I have around about 115 newtons. I won't worry about decimal points because we're using uh, approximations here. So it's, it's around about 115 newtons. That is the amount of force that we have drawing this cyclist to the center of the circle. And now we just have to apply that to this formula up here. The centripetal force is equal to mv squared on r. Therefore, 115 newtons is equal to 60 times v squared on r and r was equal to 60 as well so actually if we can cancel those down 
60v squared. We end up with 115 is equal to v squared, or v is equal to the square root of 115. which comes to 10.7 meters per second. That is the speed at which this cyclist has to be moving around that velodrome due to this frictional force here. If we were to up this frictional force even more, that would result in the cyclist moving even slower because he can, as you can see, it's sort of dragging him away from the center of the circle. If you pull something tighter towards the center of the circle, it can move faster, but if you drag it away, it has to move slower to keep going in that same circle. So V is equal to 10.7 meters per second. We also promised to find the period. Well, the time, distance is equal to velocity or speed times time. So time is equal to distance over velocity, dividing both sides by V. The total distance around this circle is 2 pi r, so that's 2 times pi times 60, that's 120 times pi, and that is 377 meters. And the speed he's traveling at is 10.7, so the time taken is 377 divided by 10.7, which comes to around about 35.2 seconds. So the period is 35.2. Another way we could have solved that is to say that the centripetal force is equal to 4 pi squared rm on t squared, which is our alternative centripetal motion formula. So those two are equivalent. And that means we would have t is equal to 4 pi squared r m on 115 square rooted. And that is equal to the square root of 4 pi squared 60 times 60 on 115. It'll take a moment for me to plug this into the calculator. Square root. But we also we also get uh, we also get an answer for t of around 35.2. I've got 35.15. So either of those methods is legitimate. And I, I'm some, I'm worrying with these videos. I'm always using this centripetal motion formula because when you find the velocity, it's very simple from there to find um, the time since it's just t is equal to 2 pi r on velocity. So if they ever ask you to find the period, the time, it's okay to use this formula and then since you found v from that formula up there to find t from that there. Uh, but if you really want you can go straight ahead and use that formula there. But I think this is the more complicated formula.